everyone out there, and welcome to the kickoff of a new video series to kind of close out the year, the disaster that's been 2020. The 12 days of OTRS Central Christmas is indeed back. What does that mean? Starting now, December 14th, every day up until Christmas Day, you're going to get a different video talking about any potential type of wrestling topic going to be in reverse countdown order. So instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, it's going to be 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now you know that I can at least count 1 to 12 and 12 to 1, forwards, backwards. Ain't I special, huh? Yeah. So make sure you smash that subscribe button. You're not going to want to miss any of this great content to come in the next two weeks or so. It's going to be a lot of fun. I look forward to it. Today's topic What's kicking off this 12 days of OTRS Central Christmas, you ask? Well, you already looked at the title so you could clearly see. It's 12 worst burials of my wrestling lifetime. Between 1985 to the present day, what are the 12 worst burials that I've seen in professional wrestling? I can't get to them all. There are certainly more burials than I have slots on the list. And you're certainly free and welcome to call them out in the comments section below. And I will acknowledge this certainly has a Vince McMahon WWF slash E slant to it uh, because they seem to be the best in the business over the years at burying people, burying ideas, burying concepts, and in some cases, burying companies. So without further ado, drum roll, please. <laughs> The 12 worst burials of my wrestling lifetime. Let's do this! Of course I was going to include the Marble Mafia's hit on Dino Bravo. Are you kidding me? The man was sitting in his chair at home, and he got shot bang, bang, dead 18 times because he got tied up into cigarette smuggling. The man is dead. If he was more worthwhile as a wrestler, he'd be higher on the list. But he's not. But I still, when I think of great wrestling burials, the Marvel Mafia and their hit on Dino Bravo in 1993 has to crack the list. yourself, how do you take a brand that had loyalty even after it had died R.I.P. and then really make sure that that died forever? I present to you WWECW. After the one night stand shows at 2005-2006, Vince McMahon decided, you know what? This is kind of interesting. People are kind of liking this. Going back to the nostalgia of the old ECW. I'm going to ruin it! I'm going to make myself the champ. I'm going to make it a third-rate WWE product. That'll show them. That'll teach them. And if they don't like it, they can kiss my ass because I own it. I own ECW. And with WWECW, I'm going to destroy it and burn it to the ground. And you got to admit, he did a bang-up job of that, didn't he? Rider made one mistake. One big mistake. He dared to get himself over when the company didn't want him to. When you think about what happened at the beginning of 2011, like this was done with intention, with malice, with anger. They didn't just bury Zack Ryder. They did everything they could to absolutely, completely ruin any chance he had of being viewed as a legitimate superstar in WWE. All because of the Long Island Ice Z show. All because he dared to go out there and get himself popular on the internet. All because he dared to get himself over when creative had nothing for him any damn way. 
Instead of latching on to that and saying, hey, let's figure out how we can incorporate that for others, or hey, this guy should be rewarded for taking chances, they just completely and totally buried him, threw him at Kane. Even did the whole crap wasn't it even Torres, and of course John Cena had to get some of that. Like, they set out to destroy him. And he never, ever recovered after that. Now, some of you might say, well, what about Medusa going on WCW Monday Nitro and dropping the WWF Women's Championship in the trash can? Well, admittedly, it was an irrelevant title anyways. Makes for a great TV moment. But when you talk about taking a brand with decades and decades of history and prestige and pedigree behind it, and you win that title like Shane Douglas did with the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in 1994, and you throw it on the ground and cut a promo talking about how that's an organization that died dead RIP five years ago, so that way you could crown yourself the new ECW World Champion? Like, he didn't just bury a wrestler or a couple of wrestlers, or creative concepts. He buried an entire territory, an entire wrestling company, an entire lineage in history. Like, that has to go down as a burial. And if NWA was more relevant back in 94, this certainly would have been even higher on the list. Back to July 2011 and the build up to that Money in the Bank pay per view. Like, fans were really buzzing about this. They were so emotionally invested that they put all logic aside and actually thought this was a shoot. That CM Punk was booked in the main event of Money in the Bank to face off against John Cena for the WWE Championship and that he wouldn't be under contract after the show. Like, people were chomping at the bit for this. There was a chance here after suffering through the abortion that was 2010 and the stand-up for WWE crap that was associated with Linda's first failed Senate campaign. Here's a chance to get something different. Here's a chance to wipe the palate clean, so to speak. Here's a chance to potentially do something edgy, interesting, and different and get everybody in wrestling buzzing about it and people outside of wrestling buzzing about it. A chance to make a new mainstream star and CM Punk. So after he wins the WWE Championship and Money in the Bank and he blows the kiss to Vince McMahon on his way out the door, what did the WWE do? Of course. What came natural? They brought him back eight days later, had him wrestle John Cena at SummerSlam, had him beat Cena to only immediately have Alberto Del Rio cash in money in the bank, so that way CM Punk could go on to lose at the next three damn pay-per-views! Well, certainly, he had multiple world, he had a long-running world title run after that, and you say, is that really truly a burial? Because he was still in a top spot. When you think about what could have happened, and you think about what could have been, and how the company sat there and basically used that lengthy title reign as an apology to say, hey, we were really fucking stupid. We really screwed this up. All because we had to sell pay-per-views for SummerSlam. It was absolutely 100,000% a burial because you took the hottest guy in your company, the hottest guy in wrestling, and had him job out to Triple H, the next pay-per-view, then after that get pinned or beat by Alberto Del Rio in a triple threat for the title. And then it wasn't at the third pay-per-view then down the road. Didn't him and Triple H have to tag team and they lost as well? So by the time he won the belt from ADR at Survivor Series 2011, it was too goddamn late. This is absolutely a burial. It was WWE cutting off their leg despite their face. And it's no surprise that CM Punk had all that lingering resentment fester and he decided to take his ball and go home after the Royal Rumble in 2014.
When you think of burials, it is like total domination and imposing your will to the point that there is no hope for recovery ever. And number eight on the list has to be there. Scott Steiner versus the English language and mathematics. Think about his promo at Sacrifice 2008. 33% That's all you got to say. Like math has never been able to recover from that. And the English language, like you have a two decade long category of Scott Steiner versus the English language where it seems like every time you turn around, He's getting beaten up by the English language, but as a matter of fact, Big Papa Pump is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. His peaks for his freaks and all that crap. He destroyed, mutilated, and brutalized the English language to the point that it's never recovered. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is an absolute, total, complete, one-sided domination and burial. <laughs>
mean, we could make an entire list just of Triple H burials. I mean, there's a reason he's God. Because he could make burials happen out of thin air. It's a miracle, I swear. But when you really think about it, he's just his own number in and of itself. Number four, Triple H. And in specific, I want to talk about the reign of God. That terrorist reign that he went on with the company between 2002, when he was just handed the World Heavyweight Championship, all the way to WrestleMania 21. I'm even leaving out the burials like what he did to Sheamus, beating him at WrestleMania 26 when he had no business doing so. And then when Sheamus put him out of commission, when he comes back, he gets ready to face Taker at 27. Who's he destroying at ringside? It's Sheamus. Like, you can even talk about those burials and all the pot shots and everything he's taken at people on commentary and in promos and interviews over the years. But when you really think about the king of the shovel, you think about that damn reign of God from 2002 to 2005. Like they created a storyline reason to just hand him a world championship because SmackDown had the belt now. Then he proceeded to not put over RVD, not put over Kane. We'll never forgive him for what happened to Booker T at WrestleMania 19. And even as you think about what happened once you got into evolution, and I'm leaving so many pieces out, once Randy Orton actually won the world championship from the Invisible Man at SummerSlam in 2004, Triple H is like, Hooray, I'm going to attack you now! How dare you! And immediately win the belt back from him like he was even in the business of burying other Breakfast Club members. It eventually stopped with the got to Batista at WrestleMania 21 and he decided he was going to lose a couple pay-per-views in a row. But some fans are going to bring up Goldberg. But there are so many names that you could bring up. Eugene, for God's sakes. Even though you can say, well, he helped elevate Eugene's profile while they made sure that Eugene wasn't going anywhere after that. The fact of the matter remains, the bottom line is, when you think about God and you think about the king of the shovel and the king of the burials, you know, and talking about other burials and you say, this is something that the man with three H's would appreciate, you go back to this reign of terror from getting handed that World Heavyweight Championship in 2002, the RVDs, the Canes, the Scott Steiners, Booker T's, later on, Randy Orton, like, that was a true reign of terror where burials were being thrown around all over the damn place. Certainly some of you are going to ask, well, what about Randy Orton and what he did to Kofi Kingston in 2009? What about Randy Orton when he won the belt from Christian the same week that Christina won it back in 2011? Like, how's Randy Orton not on this list? Literally, you could almost make an entire damn list just about Breakfast Club burials, but we can't fit everybody in. And when you think about Randall Keith Orton in comparison to God, there is no contest when it comes to burials. And even when it comes to God, mercy be, like even in the book, of Hunter, it talks about there will be one that comes along whose burials will be greater in number and significance. And that is, of course, John Cena. You talk about the reign of God, that reign of terror. It was a couple of years with other things mixed in throughout the decades. But John Cena, literally, it was a decade of fucking doom and destruction throughout the WWE roster. Every time you turned around, they would build somebody up just for him to tear him down and destroy him. Whether that's an Umaga, whether that is the freaking Nexus. Do I even need to go there with SummerSlam 2010? But that's not all. Beating Rusev at WrestleMania. Beating Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania when he had absolutely no business doing it. I could go, even talk about when CM Punk was the WWE Champion. And yet he wasn't main eventing most of the shows because John Cena still had the freaking main event. I could go on and on and on. And all of these younger fans that sit there and put him on a pedestal absolutely make me sick. Do you idiots not realize that the fucking fruits of the labor that John Cena have put in have been reaped now? And that's why this company's in the damn shape it's in! And now people want to sit there and celebrate John Cena like he's some type of great legend. Yeah, he's putting over guys when he doesn't care anymore. It doesn't freaking matter. 
And the same uh, shameful thing is, is time after time throughout the years of his decade of doom and destruction through WWE, the ultimate, the epitome, the peak of Breakfast Club business, when the business suggested it was time to put somebody else over, John Cena always, always, always made it about him. two is really a combination of two things. Number one, it's Vince McMahon in March of 2001 buying both WCW and ECW and those companies ceasing to be. That's a pretty big burial. But then when you follow it up a couple of months later and throughout the rest of that same year and you put together that abomination and abortion of a storyline that was the invasion angle, all just so that way at the end of the day you could put WWF over because your insecurities couldn't let you do really big business. You put together this joke-ass storyline that had to still revolve around the WWF talent, like, and it became a McMahon versus the McMahons type of storyline. That represents to me the ultimate in freaking burials. Not only did you buy two brands, two companies, and they were out of business afterwards, when you started to bring some of those talents in, you did everything you possibly could to shit all over the legacies of both companies. At no point in time was that invasion angle interesting. At no point in time did you think that WWF was ever a threat. And it was all about Vince, and even to this day, when you think about Triple H going back to the reign of God and how it extends, the fact that he was beating Sting at WrestleMania 31 just lets you show that Vince McMahon could put his ego to side for the betterment of the business, and it's still about how he wants to flex his muscle and be the true king of professional wrestling to this day. So for buying WCW and ECW, that was a burial. And then to come back and do the invasion angle, you hurt the damn fans' feelings. You damn right you did almost two decades later. I still can't get over it. I've never gotten over it, and I never will get over it. And neither did millions of fans who no longer watch professional wrestling. That's a pretty damn big burial, if you ask me. Too soon. I mean, I'm not trying to be too morbid here or too much of a wise ass, but the number one worst burial that I've ever seen in professional wrestling is what happened to Owen Hart that tragic night, May 23rd, 1999, the Over the Edge pay-per-view. Not only did they put him in that stupid blue blazer gimmick, they had him sitting there repelling from the rafters, but then they went with a company who had faulty equipment and poor safety checks. The man literally died on pay-per-view. Like, how is that not a burial? The situation and circumstance they put him in led to his death. And then not only that, Owen Hart not only died that night, but the WWF, and most importantly of all, Vince McMahon decided the best way to honor his legacy and honor the man the show must go on! Never mind the fact that the fans in attendance just saw a man hurdle 80 feet down to the frickin' mat, saw his blood and brain smattered, splattered all over the damn place, watched as a man literally died in front of their eyes, but we need two more hours plus of wrestling pay-per-view, because that's what the fans came to see. You want to talk about the ultimate burial of Owen Hart, the ultimate burial of a man, his career, his accomplishments, his achievements, his family, the man him damn self. You just saw somebody die. You couldn't wait to do the show another night. You couldn't refund the fans. Bullshit. What I think about the ultimate in burials, this is, was, and always will be, number one, how this company did Owen Hart and what happened to Owen Hart at Over the Edge 1999 and the fact that the show must go on is beyond question the number one, number one burial 
in my wrestling lifetime. Horrible. There you have it, my list of the 12 worst burials of my wrestling lifetime spanning about three and a half decades. Not every egregious or notable or memorable burial was even able to crack the list. This is just my list the way that I see it. So you can feel free in the comments to let me know what you think about my list of the 12 worst burials in my wrestling lifetime. Let me know what your worst burials of your wrestling lifetime are as well. And make sure you subscribe and you check out the rest of this 12 days of OTR Essential Christmas. Next up on the slate, the next video, the 11 most heavenly ladies in professional wrestling. That shall be a tasty, tasteful, classy, wonderfully put together video with absolutely no derogatory language or sexual innuendos whatsoever. I'm sure of it.